In digital forensics labs across the country lie countless hard drives, smartphones, and computers, each containing crucial evidence waiting to be analyzed. We do have a backlog of about 200 cases. That 200 case backlog dating back more than five years. Every day the cases are put on hold, perpetrators roam free, and the victims are denied justice, all because the tools and resources needed to process digital evidence are stretched too thin. But now, forensics analysts and instant responders have a new tool that could dramatically change the amount of time required to process digital evidence. CAPE is the closest thing the forensics industry has ever had to a magic button. But as important as this tool is, it almost never existed. One of the groups that tested it really didn't do anything. I think more or less the directive was find something bad that we can say and we can just shut this down, write a write up a report and make it go away. In today's episode of the InfoSec Toolshed, we'll learn the origin story of the game-changing forensics tool that almost never was, CAPE. CAPE is the Kroll Artifact Parser and Extractor, and it's written by Eric Zimmerman and distributed at Kroll.com. Kroll is Eric's employer and is a risk advisory firm who, among other things, provides corporations with digital forensics investigation services. Eric Zimmerman, CAPE's creator, was a special agent in the FBI who developed many tools that are still used exclusively by law enforcement today and not available to the general public. Today, Eric is working for the public sector, and he does digital forensics investigations, and the tools that he develops are made public. Eric also teaches classes for the SANS Institute, including a class that he co-authored with Kevin Rippa called Forensics 498, Digital Acquisition and Rapid Triage. Before talking with Eric, I wanted to get a better understanding of just how game-changing this tool was, so I spoke with some forensics experts. So give me an idea of what it would have been like before CAPE to go out to the field and collect digital artifacts versus what it's like now? Well, before it was almost entirely manual. So we would do things like use FTK Imager to go in, preview the live image, select certain forensic artifacts, add them to the custom content image, and then create that custom content image. So there wasn't a whole lot of pre-configuration that you could do. It was each individual computer. The great things about CAPE is speed. It was built for speed. You can grab 99% of all the forensic artifacts that you need probably in under 300 seconds. Two, totally configurable. No matter whether you're looking for forensic artifacts, individual files, complete folders, CAPE can do that also in the target config modules. Uh, Third, you can use the command line or the GUI and you can set it up so that you only collect or if you're using the GUI, you're only presented those items that you want the incident handler to select. Once CAPE came out, we're talking about a completely portable approach that we can walk up to a computer, plug it in, literally in 300 seconds, walk away with 99% of all the forensic artifacts you could possibly want. And it doesn't get much better on the price point. It's completely free. But in terms of what it, w- what it has replaced, I will put CAPE beside any multi-thousand dollar forensic suite. CAPE has changed the way we collect artifacts drastically. Just from the perspective of speed alone, let alone accuracy, uh, surgical strike styles of information collection, CAPE is the closest thing the forensics industry has ever had to a magic button, which is what everybody always wants is the magic button. When we started with uh, Forensics 498, our tagline was, Uh, going from seizure to actionable intelligence in 90 minutes or less. Then Eric comes out with CAPE. We had to revise that to nine minutes or less. It is no exaggeration, so much faster, so much more targeted, and it parses what it collects so that we can get to the heart of the matter immediately. And with that, I was ready to hear from the tool's author. So I asked Eric Zimmerman, why did you create CAPE? Saying that I was forced into it's probably not the right way to describe it, but uh, it was out of necessity. So I had 
I, I've been into development and programming and managing computers and all that stuff since I've been, uh, you know, out of, out of college, early twenties, whatever. And when I joined the FBI, I got put on a task force. And of course, one of the things that we need to do all the time is go through evidence and we would get more and more evidence and it becomes inefficient. We have these tools that aren't doing what we need. And one of the people on the task force is like, Hey, I heard you are good with computers. You know how to program. We need something that does, that can help us go find, go through pictures and videos faster. Okay. Well, let me see what I can do. And, and then oh, here's look there. Now you can see all the thumbnails of the pictures, but wouldn't it be neat if, and then it was fill in the blank artifact, right? Oh, how about show me link files, show me, um, browser history, show me passwords that are saved, whatever that just kept getting bolted on. So 2010, somewhere in there, I had written a tool called Z search, <clears throat> uh, which was kind of like grassroots me in Salt Lake city, which is where I was, was with the FBI and through my contacts with other agents and law enforcement that were doing crimes against children stuff, I'd say, Hey, test this out for me. Let me know if this is a horrible idea or if this is useful. And so we started using it locally on the task force. We started using it locally at, at my field office. Agents in L, uh, San Francisco started using it that, uh, that I knew. And then I got it in front of a supervisor and he's like, well, I'm gonna, my guys are gonna use it because that is a huge step forward in what we're able to do. So time goes forward. Um, bureaucracy does what bureaucracy does. Somebody finds out about Z search and it's a huge fiasco internally as far as like, who are you in Salt Lake city to be writing this tool? Um, you're, you're outside of your lane. That became a, a problem, right? Especially me as a newer agent. It's like, great. Now I got people at headquarters and titles that I don't even want anything to do with They're They're, looking to cause me problems, whatever their intentions were, right? Uh, and some of them maybe were, we need to make sure we're doing this the right way because precedent and case law, I'm sure there, that might have been maybe part of it, somebody somewhere, but a lot of it was just, you're stepping into my kingdom and I don't like that. Uh, and so during the course of that, one of the, the supervisor that I had initially started to run this through, he was pretty well connected and could facilitate getting stuff done in different places. And so the software went to get tested. And um, initially, that, that was kind of what happened after. Initially, one of the groups that tested it really didn't do anything. I think more or less the directive was find something bad that we can say, and we can just shut this down, write, a, write up a report and make it go away. And so they wrote like a two page summary, uh, whose essential conclusion was Z search is malware because Norton antivirus flagged one of the files in it. When I ran it, that was, that was the, basically the premise of their conclusion, which was a near soft utility that pulled passwords, like save passwords for email or chat clients and stuff like that. So clearly not malicious, but now this is official government record, right? It's in the system. And so <clears throat> I wrote a, a 42 page response, uh, basically just reverse engineering the code that they were worried about and just showing that all their concerns were not founded. Um, but now, now that was official record. So now you have two opposing pieces of paper in the system. And it was now the position of FBI lawyers. Well, anytime this software is used, those statements are going to have to be given over to the defense. Uh, and now their solution was just rename it. And so I, I changed it from Z search <laughs> to OS triage and everything was now just fine. It went through the process. This is where that supervisor came in. It went through, um, uh, you know, all the various back channels of, of testing and validation. And, um, that's a whole nother story in and of itself. But it, it finally was approved, and now it's a worldwide global law enforcement related tool. So literally tens and thousands of users uh, using it all over the place. I mean, it made thousands and thousands of cases.
So that was OS triage. But OS triage, t- OS triage was more for the frontline investigator. It wasn't meant for uh, a forensic examiner. Somebody that knew what they want, you could have a meaningful discussion about, oh, let, let's distinguish between prefetch and the USN journal. Whatever forensic type artifacts that you want, OS triage is, is not necessarily the tool for that. It takes a lot of different things and displays them in a consistent way for a less technical investigator to be able to make sense of and move the ball forward in their case. Now, when I left the Bureau in 2015, late 2015, and I went over to Kroll, at the time, somebody was working on, literally, it was a batch file, uh, dot bat kind of a thing. And it was, I need to add fill in the blank artifact. Okay. And they go in there and they add another if else or, you know, a switch statement or whatever the, the, the thing was at the time. And, you know, everybody knows the, the problems with that where you're just stringing together disparate output and it's brittle and I can't extend it and say I only want to do this but not that. So my boss at the time, I'm like, hey, I want to take that and kind of turn this into an actual program slash framework. And that's really where it started. It was to basically move away from doing everything in a command shell to being able to do things more forensically. And so that's where CAPE came out. Uh, the idea started. I don't, I don't remember. I think it, I probably did call it that even from the very beginning um, of, the, of that process. But the, the goal was initially just collection, right? And so strip away the, the need to even write code anymore. You don't even need to write any C sharp or anything and make all of the uh, collection definitions externally driven. And I just use YAML. YAML made it simple to do key value pairs, define nesting, all that kind of stuff. And that's where it started. So I just had a framework. Cape in and of itself, it, it really doesn't know how to do anything. If I just gave you the executable, you'd be disappointed because it doesn't know how to collect anything. It gets all of its functionality based on those targets. And so the targets are what we define to have it collect an MFT or link files or jump lists. And we can do regex and it can do recursive searching. Now, because it was all external, now anybody could write targets all day, do a a, a GitHub uh, fork, do a modification and then do a, a push request or a pull request. And you have the new targets and modules. Now, well, the targets anyway, modules are a separate thing. So it was very easy then for me to like other people can start defining file specs and types and this log is here and that log is there. Like, I don't care about that. So I don't, you're not, I don't need to feel like somebody's coming to me and saying, can you make me a target that collects these WISO logs because they're really important to me. No one else, it's such a niche thing, but now I don't need to, you don't need to involve me. You are in control of what you collect, how you collect it, what you call it, everything, which is great for you and it's great for me. And then from there it was, okay, well, I'm reading a file system. Now, what about lock files? It's a huge problem when you iterate, live, do live response on a system and registry hives are in use or event logs are in use or I need the MFT. So now I have to have a way to do raw disk reads. So you figure that out. Now I can, doesn't matter if the file's in use or not, I can do a raw disk read, read the underlying clusters, and I have the data. Now, meanwhile, we're still calculating a SHA-1 hash value of the source and the destination as we're copying things out and we're, we're deduplicating. So you're not going to collect the same file more than once. You could turn that off, but I don't know why you'd want to. Um, and then it was, well, I... This is great, right? You're you're making you're letting me dump this out to a folder where I'm I'm starting, but now I need to have all those files that I've collected in a container. Okay, well I can zip them up. Okay, well, that's cool. Zip file. Can you put it into a VHDX? I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Now I can do that. So people just have said I needed to do this. I wanted to go to S3. I want to be able to shove my collection out to uh, Azure. I want to use a pre-signed URL, whatever the, the, the mechanism is. And so I've just added those things slowly over time um, up to and including CAPE in and of itself has a built-in SFTP server. So you could use CAPE to start an SFTP server that's temporary. It will show you all the configuration switches when it starts. You take those switches into another instance of CAPE, collect 
through the enterprise. And when you're done, you just shut down that temporary copy of, of SFTP. So you don't have to like provision some server that's uh, running on, on a Linux box and it's on the internet and it's now it's available and we got to, oh, now somebody brute force that. It's all temporary. So over the course of time, either myself or other people have, hey, we should make it do this. Or have you thought about that? Now, at some point in there, I thought the collection's only half of the problem. The other half is I need to get the data in a meaningful format from an MFT or a link file or a jump list or fill in your favorite artifact to analytical work product. So how can I go about automating not only the collection, but the execution of tools against the data you've just collected? And that's where the other half comes in. That's modules. Modules run command line tools. So I want to say we have like close to 400. So pretty much any command line tool that you could imagine, we have a module for, and you could run against either a live response, you could dump memory, you could run the tools that are going to capture a BitLocker encryption key, it, it extract out the recovery key for you. Um, you can run B strings, you could check the registry, you can parse out link files, anything that you could run programmatically, just by manually going into a command line and doing stuff, we could run those command line tools in an automated fashion during the course of collection, right? Collect, process, upload, just upload my work product. What if I'm threat hunting and I don't want to backhaul a bunch of data? Well, just run those modules or collect locally and every 15 minutes upload a CSV for your favorite set of artifacts. From there, it kind of grew into this, what I like to describe as a processing tool chain where I can collect and then extract my work product but it's any of those things if you have pre-collected e01 or somebody's like hey here's a bunch of link files what can you tell me well i could run lecmd manually or i can just point cape at to where those link files are and i don't have to type out any of those command line arguments for lecmd so everything is managed for you and, and cape uh, on the fly before it executes stuff will flip the uh, variables around and, and give the appropriate paths to where the files are and where you want me to save the data. So it's all transparent. So once you set up a module, you never have to type another command line again. Um, now Cape in and of itself is a command line tool, but there's a graphical wrapper called Gcape that literally is a GUI and you just click, 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 type in a box and it builds you a command line at the bottom and you just launch it. And then it of course spawns the executable, the command line version does its thing, and you've got everything done pretty much in just a few seconds. So it depends on what you're doing, but you know, three seconds to, to maybe six minutes for a typical collection uh, is, is probably the average. And when you start comparing that to, well, it takes four hours to image a one terabyte hard drive, and then I've got to verify it. So that's eight hours before I can even tell you, does this file exist? Has this thing been opened? Is there a jump list that points to the plans that the Death Star has been viewed on this computer? I can figure that out. I could do I could do 30 of those types of questions before the, the first E01 is even created. If we start thinking uh, the way we need to think with the, the size of the drives and the way this problem just keeps to exp expanding, if we start to do those triage collections because really i don't care who's doing your exam they're probably not looking at more than one to two percent of the data on that hard drive anyway when they give you back your report so what am i waiting around for the other 98 percent that i'm just going to have to ignore and wait to be passed on by to to start getting answers our discussion on cape is just getting started we have a full one hour uncut interview with eric zimmerman he demonstrates how to use the tool and how to select different targets, different modules, and how to tie those two together. If you wanna learn how to write your own forensics tools, come check out my class, SANS SEC 573, Automating Information Security with Python. It starts from the very beginning, assuming no knowledge of programming whatsoever, and then it takes you from writing functions, to writing modules, to writing applications that you can use in your next investigation.